to hear again from Trans Widow Uta Hagen YouTube channel and WordPress blog Uta Hagen Grass Widow dot WordPress dot com. And this is my new vase I bought for myself. <laughs> and uh, it has a really skinny opening, so it has to be sort of a, a tall, uh, skinny bouquet. These are my Jowy Winnie dahlias and a one of the brightest flocks and uh, Laetrus, which is called, oh gosh, something feather, I think. Um, and this is a coleus. I guess it didn't like being picked. That's a, a foliage plant. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's keep some of it in there. There we go. Now, um, what mostly I'm doing is um, I'm going to read this report about... Um, a so-called social justice paper written by um, cross-sex ideating so-called sociologists advocating that um, women who ideate that they are male and get pregnant should not be discouraged from taking testosterone during the pregnancy. Um, and it's, it's pretty... Um, Pretty out there, yeah, pretty chutzpah, I'd call it, chutzpah, yeah. First, though, I'm going to show you um, some photos from my book. And the reason I want you to see this is that it's a great spangled fritillary, and those are the wings. That one didn't make it here. <laughs> um, must have gotten eaten by a bird. And then there's this great big uh, spider out there that uh, was on a big web and so that's from my book in the curated woods true tales from a grass widow available in uh ebook form as well as soft cover like i just showed you and um one day if i if i uh, find that i don't have any more trans widows to report on <laughs> maybe i'll i'll start reading some segments of the book as i have um, actually done before um, now, <clears throat> um, oh yes, and we are up to Trans Widow number 45. Um, I'm waiting for her to um, uh, answer all the 20 questions on 20 questions to ask a trans widow. And number 44 answered all the questions, and it was sort of typical. She did um, spend some time living uh, below the poverty line. The amazing thing was that the, her husband, uh, so-called, came out uh, as cross-sex ideating when she was pregnant with her second child. And she went into early labor, and so he was there during the second labor, even though they were in the process of separating. And he co-opted her labor pains. <laughs> so that's two of us. Two out of uh, 44 so far. <laughs> okay, now this is by Jennifer Lal, who is the, and uh, Jennifer Lal and Callie Fell, who are both of uh, the Center for Bioethics and Culture. I think their YouTube channel is called a Center for Bioethics and Culture Network. And mostly what they're um, researching is, is the harms of surrogacy. But uh, they also did a uh, film about detransitioners, and I think that's up on their YouTube channel now. So, so these people are to be highly recommended. So <clears throat> I'm, this is rather lengthy. I'm going um, I'm, I'm to make part one and part two. I'm going to do that right now. Let's see. We'll read the first six to eight pages. Okay, so this is concerning pregnancy and the health of the fetus. Huh. In recent years, a striking paradigm shift in medical ethics has emerged, driven by progressive political ideologies purporting to champion social justice. This shift has precipitated a surge in initiatives centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. The resulting effects have varied considerably. They include the introduction of explicit racial bias in treatment protocols in a quest for health equity. Um, and an unsettling disregard for biological sex as an important variable in both medical research and patient care. Instead, the new radical movement favors categorizing individuals based on their self-identified and medically irrelevant gender identity. 
Even more alarmingly, we are witnessing a direct assault on the language associated with women's health in medicine. Terms traditionally used in clinical settings such as mothers, <laughs> which she had to put that in quotes, uh, are replaced by neutral alternatives, so-called, like birthing parents, and the term women is frequently substituted within, uh, with individuals with a cervix. Even though nearly half of women don't know what the cervix is, and such language may therefore cause a significant number of women to forego important routine cervical screenings. This trend, overlooking biological sex as a critical medical variable, stems from an ideological drive to queer the natural world. The proponents of this view resist categorization, arguing that such practices are instruments of oppression wielded by the powerful against the less powerful. According to this perspective, medicine must eschew not only biological categorization of patients, but also traditional notions of what is deemed desirable or adverse patient outcomes. These ideological shifts have raised substantial concerns regarding the potential harm of that such denial of biological realities could inflict on patients. However, recent academic discourse has escalated these concerns to new levels. A provocative new paper in, I'll put this in the notes, the journal called Qualitative Research in Health. So, you know, what we really need is quantitative research and especially quantitative research um, where women as a group, as a category, are considered because um, all kinds of things affect women differently than men. Okay, it's titled Medical Uncertainty and Reproduction of the Normal, uh, and then subtitled Decision Making Around Testosterone Therapy in Transgender Pregnancy by Pfeffer and colleagues. It draws us, it propels us further down the road of medical malpractice. <laughs> the author is a group of transgender sociologists, that means in the Utahagan lexicon, uh, cross sex ideating people who call themselves social scientists and enthusiasts and healthcare activists with not one medical, medical degree among them argue to dramatically remove the goalposts of medical ethics, choosing to completely disregard the health, safety, and well-being of the developing fetus. All in the name of, in quotes, trans inclusion, abiding by their paper's guidance would land us in a vacuum devoid of medical ethics and a seismic shift away from the importance of scientific research and medical evidence in favor of activist directed health care. The authors argue that gendered pregnancy care is too focused on helping women have healthy babies and that it might be okay for trans men to continue taking testosterone during pregnancy despite the known health risks to the fetus and its and effects on normal development, the known, known risks. The desire for normal fetal outcomes, in quotes, normal fetal outcomes, they decided to put that, you know, like make it a special phrase that's something we have to fight it, fight against. <laughs> according to the authors, is rooted in a problematic desire to, in quotes, protect their offspring from becoming anything other than normal and reflect historical and ongoing practices for creating ideal and normative bodies for offspring. Wow, so if they don't want normal, are they going to start perhaps taking thalidomide during pregnancy? Then they could have a child that is really definitely not in this really, really narrow patriarchal idea of normal. This is quite frankly, says um, uh, Fell and Lau, this is quite frankly insane. In the paper, Pfeffer et al. maintain that lacking an uncertain, lacking, un lacking and uncertain medical evidence uh, which they call HRT, that's such a bad euphemism, home, hormone replacement therapy, uh, with testosterone during pregnancy and uh, chest feeding, they say, in a highly gendered treatment context. Oh, no, it's only pregnant women who are going to the obstetricians. <gasps> the waiting room must be such a bore. <laughs> Actually, I loved the waiting room. I loved hanging around, hanging around with pregnant ladies. 
Uh, gendered treatment context in pregnancy and lactation care. Uh, these Pfeffer et al. maintain that both patients and providers tend to pursue a precautionary <gasps> offspring focused treatment approach. Offspring focus. They're focused on the baby in a woman's pregnancy. What? The authors of the article strive to underscore the prevailing power dynamic and expertise discrepancy between medical professionals and their pregnant patients. <laughs> well, the first time you're pregnant, you know, you hope you're going to a practitioner, a midwife or a doctor or something who actually has done a few deliveries and handled a few different things that came up in pregnancy. One hopes that I would, I, yeah, I am not going to consult someone who doesn't have more expertise than me. <laughs> okay, they also highlight lack of training on trans pregnancy care. How dare they? And the failure of the current precautionary approach within a highly gendered space of pregnancy care. However, conspicuously absent is any robust concrete data. Isn't that funny? There is none. There's no robust concrete data <laughs> about anything involving cross-sex ideation. Uh, yes, instead they bolster their argument by cherry-picking quotations from their study involving a pool of 70 international trans individuals, which I assume if they're getting pregnant, they are natal females, and 22, in quotes, healthcare providers, or simply those who were identifying as healthcare providers at the time of the study. Oh my goodness. Huh. Before continuing, we must point out the obvious flaw in the article. Pregnancy care isn't gendered. It is sexed. Only women can get pregnant. How about that? Females. Oi. Uh, only the biologically fertile human females possess the physical attributes necessary for pregnancy and childbirth. This is simple biological reality. Oh, I was talking with my friend, you know, Mishanta Chatan, uh, who was visiting me. Yeah, I was talking to her yesterday and I said, well, I'm a 66 year old woman who wants to have excuses to eat a little bit more and get a little bit pudgy in my middle. And so I want to ideate that I'm pregnant. Why not? That's ageism. If you're not going to let me ideate that I'm pregnant. Let us now turn our attention to the role of a physician in caring for a pregnant woman in the developing fetus. The doctor-patient relationship is sacred, considered to be the core element in the ethical principles of medicine. Uh, the duty to do good, the duty to, to not do bad, and respect for autonomy, respecting patients' right to self-determination, justice, the principle to treat all people equally and equitably. In the context of pregnancy, the physician must uphold these principles towards both the mother and her unborn child. The authors of the publication are quick to point out the power and expertise imbalance between doctors and impatience. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer, I mean, yeah, Jennifer Lal and and um, the other person's name is, is Fell, I think, uh, at, over at the Center for Bioethics and Culture. Uh, this is neither a new nor concerning arrangement. <laughs> Also, women are keenly aware of the potential power disparities or injustices that exist in medicine, notably in obstetri obstetrics and gynecology. And I can attest to that because in 1988, when I was having my first child, I really had to advocate for myself that I was just really determined to do this naturally. And I didn't want to get hooked up to an IV unless they needed to do it all of a sudden on an emergency basis. And I succeeded. It was 12 hours. Um, and all the netties out there, no, you didn't go through that. Oh, yeah. How do we know <laughs> that Joy, my, my uh, trans widow number 44, uh, knew that her husband was co-opting uh, her labor experience um, after he came out during that second pregnancy? Well, during the labor, when they called her name, um, you know, I guess she was sitting first or something or maybe wheeled in in a wheelchair or something and then they called her name to get her set up. And he started going towards them instead of, you know, helping her. <laughs> and, he, and she said he had this demeanor 
of, uh, you know, sucking up what she was experiencing. And, and this is this pregnancy envy stuff and all that is pretty common. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, generally speaking, women are often not accorded the same degree of seriousness as men in healthcare, particularly concerning pain. And there's some research about that. Um, the cornerstone of a patient's trust lies in their belief that their ph physicians recommended treatment plan will consistently be informed by the four core principles of medical ethics. The concerns raised by Pfeffer and colleagues focus on modern treatment approach physicians take, which they deem excessively precautionary and offspring focused. <laughs> Fortunately, caring for the child and mother are neither mutually exclusive nor zero sum. And that's where we will stop for this one. Thank you. Remember to be well in mind and body always and count the butterflies.